Hi friends, and welcome back. In the last episode, we built a language server from scratch. We implemented completion so a user typing in a text file could get dictionary suggested words as they type. In this episode, we'll be building on top of that. We're going to implement diagnostics to identify misspelled words and show the user where the problem is. Then on top of that, we're going to build code actions. These code actions will allow a user to accept a suggestion to replace the misspelled word. Are we building spell check? Yes. But it's going to be fun, I swear. And along the way, we'll learn a lot about the language server protocol. Did you know that VS Code doesn't have a spell checker built in? Who knew? So come with me and dream what you can do with code actions and diagnostics. Let's hop right in. Before we get into the new content, I do want to correct one thing that we should have done last time. So in completion, we have up to a thousand results that we can return based on the prefix the user is typing. So when they type the letter A, we don't want to return everything in the dictionary that starts with A. We're going to limit it to 1,000. And then as they type more, we can get better results. The problem is, if there are less than 1,000 things that match, we're still returning is incomplete of true. And that's actually a lie in that case, because uh, them typing more characters, the client sending us more characters, is not going to give better results if there are already fewer than 1,000. So we're just going to change this real quick. So we'll say, it's incomplete if items.length is max length. And then we'll change this to be max length. And then we'll just set a constant of max length as 1,000. So now if the user types in a few characters and ends up getting less than 1,000 results, the client knows to no, no longer worry about sending us additional letters because they're not going to get better results. So let's test this out. We'll click the debugger. We will type in H-E-L-L-H. -L -L -H. We see that there are a few things that start with that prefix. If we open our log, so we'll search for is incomplete, and we get true, 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 false. And we can see that eventually we did exhaust the space of where these prefix letters could match words. So up here, we clearly have the H-E prefix. Down here, we're in the H-E-L. And the items that match H-E, you know, the last one we have is H-E-M, so there's more than 1,000 of those. But once we get to H-E-L, we've exhausted our matches such that we have fewer than 1,000. So we send is incomplete a false, and the client knows, I don't need to request any more completions for these prefix characters because I'm not going to get better results. So it saves some work on the client. And it also just makes this honest. And frankly, I, I'm an honest guy. I like being honest, even when it's to computers. So we're going to commit this up and start on new work. The next feature I want to build is diagnostics. As you can see, I've typed the words hello and there. Hello is spelled incorrectly. There are too many L's. In an ideal world, when a spelling error occurs, we would have some red squiggly underline for the word that's spelled incorrectly we would see a problem down here in the problem section. We'd be able to click on it to get to the problem. And then once we correct the problem, it would go away. We can do that with language server diagnostics. Let's look at the docs. I happen to know the word diagnostic, which is a bit of a shortcut, but you could probably find out this concept on your own just by browsing through the documentation and looking for something that seems relevant to the problem at hand. We're going to look at pull diagnostics. From there, we'll scroll down to document diagnostics. So document diagnostics is the method text document diagnostic. It takes params of document diagnostic params, which we'll want to deal with at some point. And then the response is a document diagnostic report. Document diagnostic report is either a related full document diagnostic report or a related unchanged document diagnostic report. Let's look at the first one. Related full document diagnostic report extends full document diagnostic report. That sounds promising. And it also adds related documents uh, so that you can indicate that a problem in this file is caused by a problem in another file and vice versa. We're just going to care about the full document diagnostic report for now. We can see that it has a kind, which is full. Full in this case is just the string full, so we can hard code that. And then it has a optional results ID. Not interested in that right now. And then it has an array of diagnostic items. So let's copy this. And we already copied our method. And so we're in a good place to get started. Have me make over to our text editor. We'll go to our server. 
And the first thing we're going to do is add our new method down here. So we will paste in the text document diagnostic. And as usual, we'll call this diagnostic. That doesn't exist yet, but that's okay. Uh, we'll make it exist at some point. So we'll go to completion and open a new file so that we're in the same folder as completion. This is a text document action and we'll call it diagnostic.ts. And now we can paste in our interface. So we'll clean this up a little bit. Again, we said that this is just going to be the string full. And the results ID, we don't care about. The actual items we do care about. So what is a diagnostic? A diagnostic is compiler error warning. We see that it has an interface, so there's a range, there's a severity, there's a diagnostic code, it's optional. There's code description to describe the error code, which is optional. A source to describe what gave the diagnostic. So if you have multiple language servers or other diagnostic producers running on a file, you can see which one it came from. The diagnostic message, that's the most important part besides the range. Some tags we don't care about, related information we don't care about, data we may care about one day. Let's grab this. And so we'll paste this in and then we'll do a little cleanup. We'll keep data. We will uh, keep message, of course. We will get rid, we'll keep source. We'll just make it a hard coded string. So we'll call this LSP from scratch. And we might as well get rid of that because we're always going to provide it. Uh, code description and code we don't care about, so we get rid of those. We do want a severity and we'll make that required for us. It's optional for the language server protocol, but it's going to be required for us because I always want to provide it. So now we need a range and a diagnostic severity. We're going to go with the diagnostic severity first. And it is uh, represented as a namespace and a type. We'll get both of those. Throw those up at the top here. So we'll get rid of that, that, don't need to export that, that. All right, so now the last thing we need to know is what is a range. So we'll go back, click on range. Range is expressed as start and end positions. We've seen position before when we were working on completion. Um, so we know that we're going to need to import position, but Right now that's just in completion and it doesn't really make sense to import it for there, from there. It doesn't really make sense for it to necessarily live there. So we're going to do the classic thing and make a types file. We'll just make it in our source root and we'll paste range in there. We'll export it so that we can use it. And then we'll also grab position from completion and put that in here too. Let's export that. And now we need to fix completion to import that. So we'll do command period and add the import with the quick fix there. Over here, we'll do the same thing. Perfect. And so now we're ready to write our function. So this is export const diagnostic equals, and we're gonna take a message, which is a request message. And then we will return full document diagnostic report. Okay, and so we're not returning that yet, and uh, that means we have a problem. So we need to actually return that. So what we'll do right now, for now, is we'll just do a hard-coded version of this. So we'll return kind of full, and then items, we'll make an array, and the first item will be an error. So we'll do a severity of error. The message will be this is incorrect. The, the source will be LSP from scratch. And then what else do we need? Right, we need a range. So we're just going to fake that for now. So we'll have a start, which is line zero. These are zero base lines, as you might remember. And character four. And then we'll do an end of line zero and character eight. Okay, and that's valid. That's a perfectly valid uh, diagnostic there. We're gonna copy this just so we have another example to look at. For this one, we're going to make it a warning. And we'll say, 
This could be better. And we'll do the same thing here, but we'll put it on line one and we'll just move this around a little bit just to make it have a little more variety. So we'll restart. Oh, but we've got an error. What is our error? Oh, our error is that uh, we can't find diagnostic. So let's import that. And then now the error is that the return type is wrong. And that's because we're explicitly specifying these. Uh, we may change this at some point, but I'm just going to keep rolling with this for now. Refactoring types is always something you can do later. I'm not particularly worried about it. So now I want you to ask yourself a question. Do you think this will work? And that sounds like a loaded question and it's because it is. So maybe a better question is, why won't this work? Feel free to pause the video and think on that for a moment. If you remember from last time, why this won't work is we need to specify capabilities. Right now, the client won't know that we can handle diagnostics, so it's not going to ask for them. So what we need to do is tell the client that, hey, we're, we're a diagnostic provider too. Okay, so let's figure out what we need for our capabilities. And there's a couple of ways you can find this. One is to go back to documents. Whoops, that's too far. And scroll up a little bit, and there's the server capability specified here. The other way to find this is in your sidebar to go to lifecycle messages, initialize, because initialize is going to tell you all about server capabilities as well once you scroll down far enough. Yeah, client capabilities. Come on. Initialize result has server capabilities. Server capabilities then somewhere in here is going to specify a diagnostic provider. All right, diagnostic provider can be diagnostic options or diagnostic registration options. Diagnostic registration options extends document options. So we're just going to do the simplest thing here and specify diagnostic options. So we'll, we're going to grab this. And then what is diagnostic options? Diagnostic options has an optional identifier. It requires interfile dependencies to be specified. This says whether diagnostics in one file can change diagnostics in another file. There's this interfile dependencies. We don't have that, so it's going to be false. Workspace diagnostics say whether the you can provide diagnostics for an entire workspace. We're not going to do that. This is per file. So both of these will be false. Over in our editor, we will specify diagnostic provider. And we'll make it an object which has the interfile dependencies of false and the workspace diagnostics also false. And now we might just be good to go. Let's reload. Okay, so after a moment, the diagnostics appear. Uh, we'll give this a little more content so these can be spaced correctly. And so we see this is incorrect is right here. This could be better is the problems right there. And we can interact with these in all the visual studio ways you expect. We can't resolve these yet because they're hard coded. They're always going to come back as a problem. There's nothing really to fix because there's not actually a problem here, but we're in a wonderful place to make these dynamic. Back in our diagnostic file, let's start to think about how we could have a spell check to tell us when words are spelled incorrectly. We're going to copy some code over from completion. We'll grab the word list and we will grab these imports, they'll be helpful as well. You might ask, why are we not refactoring this to a shared file? And the reason is, this is the first version of this. We're going to take a naive approach. Later, we're going to do something different. So for the naive approach, I want to just do the simplest thing that will work, and then we'll look into better solutions. So for now, I'm just copying it rather than move stuff around that I know we'll probably end up moving back later. Uh, it doesn't hurt to repeat yourself a little bit until you know for sure that your refactoring is going to stick. So we're going to change this to just be items. And then we need to define what items is. The first thing we need to do is to parse the params that we're getting. So let's look back at the docs and we're going to figure out what we're working with here. So we'll go back to language features, back down to pull diagnostics, and then back down to document diagnostics. So we get document diagnostic params. Here we have a text document identifier and then some optional stuff we don't care about. It extends to other things we don't care about. So that's great. We really just need this. And we'll pop this over here. 
clean up a little bit. And I know we have text document identifier from our documents, so we'll just import that. So now we can add our params to the correct form here. So const params is going to be message dot params as. We're using as because we know more than our, our types do at this point. Now we want to get our document. So we'll say const content is going to be documents.get. And we're going to get it based on the params.textdocument.uri. All right, documents isn't defined, so we'll import that from our document store that we keep in memory. Const words in document are going to be content.split on non-word characters. So we see this question mark here, which tells us we did something wrong. We need to guard against content not being defined. So if not content, we're going to return. And now we need to let's return an explicit null here. And then we'll make this also be null optionally. So now we should have the words in our document. And so to find the invalid words, we'll say invalid words is going to be words in document dot filter. We're going to filter out the words where they're not uh, words dot includes word. And we're actually going to rename this to, we're going to call this uh, dictionary words just for clarity here. Okay, so now we see that the words in the, the invalid words are the words in the document that aren't in the dictionary. Perfect. Now what we want to do is iterate over the invalid words and create a diagnostic for each of them. So let's do the naive version of that. So we'll say invalid words dot for each, and we'll give it an invalid word. And hmm. I guess we actually want to start keeping track of our items up here. So we'll say const items, it's going to be a diagnostic, it's that, and then we'll do um, items.push, and we'll give it a item here. So we'll say the source is going to be our LSP from scratch, severity is going to be diagnostic severity error, the range, hmm. This is tricky. How are we going to know exactly where this is in the document? We can't really do an index of because we have our first hello. If we had another hello down here and we just did a naive index of, we would find the first one. I guess then we could find a next one at index of plus. It's probably easier to just scan this with a regex. Let's do the naive thing first though. We'll do start of line zero, character zero, and then we'll do an end of line zero character uh, 10. This is going to be a very naive approach, but hopefully it will still let us prove out the point. So the message is going to be invalid word is not in our dictionary. Okay, let's kick it and see what happens. Okay, once we hit enter to, to trigger this, sometimes they don't fire immediately on startup. So. Once you start typing, you should get some content. We see four different things aren't in the dictionary. They all have the same range indicated, so they all show up as being here, even though that's not where they are. But the good news is our spell check is working. We didn't identify there, there is fine. If we type hello just by itself, we're fine. And you'll notice if we type H-E-L, it says that's not in the dictionary. But once we turn it into a real word, then it's back again. So that's great. So let's make the actual locations work. And I think to do that, what we're going to want to do is use a regex and iterate over the lines. So what we'll say is const lines is going to be content.split on the new line. And then we'll do lines.foreach here. And that'll give us a line and a line number. So as you can see, we're already in a, a pretty good spot as far as our line number goes down here. Close that off. So we can change these to be line number and line number. Perfect. And so now we need to actually scan this. Const regex is going to be a new regular expression. 
we're going to give it a word boundary, then our invalid word, then another word boundary, and we'll make it match everything. It can match more than once, it's greedy. So then in here, we'll say let match, and then we're going to loop. So while match equals regex dot exec on the line. We're, so while that's not null, let's fix that. We want to add items. Character can now be replaced with match.index. And the ending character can, you guessed it, be replaced with match.index plus invalid word.length. Let's give this a try. So what we see when we make a minor change is that our things are successfully selected. This is interesting though. Note that hello has two indicators on line one, two indicators on line five. However, these things, which may look exactly the same, these two pieces of gibberish actually only have one indicator each. The reason for this is that we have that invalid words can contain duplicates. So because the exact same typo is in here twice, hello, we run through it twice on line one, then twice on the final line. And we, we, so we're getting duplicates for each of those. We can fix this by doing a new set here for our invalid words. And then if we try again, we can make a trivial change to trigger it. We're perfect. There, 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 and there. Telling the user that there's a problem is helpful, but what's even more helpful is helping them reach a solution. So here we see that he triple L O is not in the dictionary. We see where it's from. We can view the problem, but it says no quick fix is available. What this means is that the language server hasn't provided any fixes associated with this area of the text and this diagnostic. And so what we want to do now is to implement that. So how do we programmatically map H E triple L O to the suggestion H E double L O. One of my favorite approaches to this problem is to use the Levenstein distance. The Levenstein distance is one of my favorite algorithms for calculating a difference between strings. So basically what it does is assign a numeric value to transform one string into another. So the kitten to sitting is three because the following three edits are needed to get there. You change the K to an S, you change the E to an I, and then you add on the letter G. So you also would award a point if you were removing a letter as an uninformed to uniformed. So we can see that the distance between hello with three L's and hello with one L is one because all we have to do is remove a single character. So one way to do this would be to take our list of words and take the invalid word and then calculate the Levenstein distance between all the words in our dictionary and our invalid word and then sort the suggestions by those that are closest to zero. So we would go in ascending order. So H-E-L-L-O would come before something that was less accurate. This would work fine with a naive implementation in TypeScript for small documents. But as documents got bigger and bigger, we would eventually want to shell out to something that was better suited for doing the heavy lifting here. And this approach of shelling out to subprocesses for heavy lifting is so common that we're going to do it here to show you how it's done. We will be shelling out to the wonderful program A Spell. How you install this will depend on your operating system. On Mac OS, I'm just going to use Homebrew and do brew install A Spell. Just takes a moment to install and then we're good to go. So A Spell is super easy to use. You can look at the help file and learn a lot, but the gist of it is, is that we can do hello, we'll spell that wrong on purpose there, uh, Sally, we'll put in too many L's for Sally, and Bobby. And then what we're gonna do is echo that to a spell pipe. And the result that we get back is a header. So there's a header line that sort of explains what's being used. A spell is I spell compatible, so anyway, you can ignore this. But next we have the corrections. We see that hello was spelled incorrectly. There are three L's. There are the number of suggestions. I don't know what this means. It's zero here and 14 there. We could learn more about that, but we don't actually need to know. 
And these spelling suggestions are sorted by most likely to be correct. So hello and Sally both have things. The asterisk here indicates that there was a fine word that doesn't need to be corrected. There's one more kind of output, which is if you have something that simply isn't going to get a suggestion, then it is shown with the pound sign and then some number. Maybe that number is the number of characters. I don't know exactly, but it doesn't matter for our purposes. What we really care about is getting this output. We're going to send our content to a spell pipe. We're going to remove the header. We're going to find everything that starts with an ampersand or a pound sign. Those are invalid words. For the ones that have the ampersand, we can parse out the suggestions and then we can use those in our spelling suggestions. We're going to start by writing the code that we wish we had. So we don't want to do our own dictionary management. So we'll get rid of these things. We can also get rid of our list of dictionary words and we'll get rid of our import from the file system. We'll keep the log because we'll probably want to log things later. So now we want to imagine a different world where we have const invalid words and suggestions. And this is going to be a record of type string for our invalid word and then string array for the suggestions that could have zero or more items in it. And we'll say that that's going to be spelling suggestions, which doesn't exist yet, content. So this is the interface that we, we really wish we had. We wish that we could just get a list of invalid words and suggestions and use them here. Diagnostic doesn't need to know how that's assembled. We just wish that it was assembled. Then what we'll want to do is actually set up, uh, let's log this out, log.write, spelling suggestions, will be invalid words and suggestions. Great. Let's pull these two things down there and we'll just give them a little bit of breathing room here. Now what we can do is start iterating over these words and suggestions. So down here, we're going to have a record. So we'll do object.keys and we'll pass in our invalid words and suggestions. So we'll do for each and our callback is going to be a single invalid word. Great. And so we'll have our invalid word. This all just sort of works as expected. We're doing the same thing that we did before. Uh, I think the only thing that we really want to change is we'll get the word suggestions here. So const word suggestions is going to be invalid words and suggestions for our invalid word. Great. Let's assemble a good message based on whether there are or are not word suggestions. So if there are suggestions, we'll say message is going to be word suggestions.length. So the length is greater than zero. We'll say uh, invalid word isn't in our dictionary. Did you mean? And then we'll give it our word suggestions.join on a comma and a space. Otherwise, we'll just say invalid word isn't in our dictionary. Okay, and if we scroll back over, we see that we only had to change how we're getting our invalid words, and then now we're also going to be getting suggestions. So we still have to implement spelling suggestions, but the bulk of this file didn't change. We do need to replace this message with our crafted message above. All right, and now we're ready to implement spelling suggestions. So let's do that. To implement spelling suggestions, we're going to create a file alongside our server. So this is one of those things that could be put in a util folder or whatever, but I don't really want to think about that right now. So we're just going to save this as spelling suggestions.ts. Great. So we're going to export const spelling suggestions equals a function. And that function is going to take content of a string and it's going to return a record of string and string array. And then we'll do that. All right, so it's not returning that yet, which makes sense. Over in Diagnostic though, we should be able to add this import and now Diagnostic's happy. So now we just need to implement this. So since we know the contract of a spell, we can basically just pipe our content into a spell pipe and then parse this output. I'm going to copy this output. 
so that we have some examples to work from here. We'll just do this as this, and then there we go. To be able to shell out to an external command, we're going to use spawn sync. There's a ton of ways to do this, but we're going to go with spawn sync. It just makes things easier because we'll just do it all in band. We're not going to do anything async or fancy. And we'll say const suggestions. Actually, we'll call this invalid words and suggestions for name and consistency is going to be that. And we'll type it as well. Great. And then at the bottom, we're going to return invalid words and suggestions. So all the types here are happy, but we're not actually doing any work yet. So let's do that. So we'll say that const all output is going to be spawn sync. We will give it the command of a spell and then the argument of pipe. Next, we'll give it some options. So the input is going to be our content and the encoding, encoding is going to be UTF-8. Is that syntax error? Okay. So if we try this and we just log the all output, we should see something similar to what we have all the, up there. Uh, let's just prove that out. So we're going to log all output. And we'll, oops, that actually should be a log.write. And we should import log. Great. Let's kick it. We'll look at our log file. And great, so we have our all output, which has, okay, so it has output on it. Let's change what we're doing here. We'll hop back over to our spelling suggestions. So we'll call .std out to get the output. We'll trim it and then we'll split on our new line character. Let's kick this again. Looking back at our log, we see that now we have an array of things that were separated on the new line. So uh, this one starts with an at symbol. We can ignore it. This one starts with an ampersand. We need to care about it. If we had a asterisk, we ignore it. If we have something that starts with a pound symbol, we care about it too. So the things that we do care about are things that begin with ampersand and pound symbol. Then what we'll do is let's have a all output for each line. And we'll say const uh, prefix is going to be line dot slice zero one. So this should give us our leading character, our at, our ampersand, our star, or our pound sign. So now we can switch on this prefix. And in the event that we have an ampersand, we know that we have a good suggestion. So what we'll do there is handle good suggestion and then break and then break. In the event that we have a pound symbol, we know that we have an invalid, but we don't have any suggestions for it. So handle invalid. And then our default, well, we, we don't really want to do anything here, so we're, we're not even going to have a default. Great. Uh, we'll, we'll break here too, just in case we add more things later. All right, so how do we handle a good suggestion? The good suggestion is going to look like this. So we'll copy that down here for better reference. Okay. And so what we really want to do is to extract both the good word and the suggestions. And we can do that with a regular expression. So we'll say const match equals line dot match. We're going to start off with an ampersand. We'll have a space that will be followed by our invalid word. That will be followed by another space and a digit. And then we will ignore everything up until the colon. Then we'll have a space and we'll have our suggestions here. So we'll do period star until the end of the line. Okay. So then what we can say is that our invalid words and suggestions match one, the first capture, equals match 
two dot split on comma and space. And we have to handle the fact that match could be null here. It, sh it shouldn't be in the real world, but we want to handle it. And we can just do that by doing a log.write spelling suggestions invalid match online and then we'll return and now that's happy and so we're gonna <laughs> hope that that works for the moment and we'll handle go ahead and handle our invalid so the invalid is going to be sort of similar here let's get the example up here so we'll paste this in and then we're gonna have very similar behavior except our regular expression is going to be different and there won't be any suggestions. So match here is going to be line.match the pound sign and then something and then a digit. Uh, and that's fine. We don't actually care about anything after that. So if, okay, so we can't redeclare the block scope. So we'll, we'll actually rename this. Uh, so we'll go down to rename symbol. This is always one of the silly things about uh, switches is that the variables are not local to the case statement. So we'll call this a suggestion match. We'll just leave this one as match because uh, I don't want to think of a better name right now. This is going to be an empty array because we don't have suggestions for it. Okay, let's try this out. Great, so hello is in our dictionary. Did you mean hello, hell, heel, etc.? The gibberish isn't in our dictionary and we don't have any suggestions, that's awesome. More gibberish, also not in our dictionary. And then once again, hello is not in our dictionary. So if we type in something here, like that, it's not in our dictionary and we get suggestions. If we type more characters, eventually we run out of suggestions because a spell is like, I just give up. There's nothing that this is close enough to. Excellent. Now that we're able to show suggestions, we should give the user a way to accept those suggestions. So again, this says no quick fixes available. So why don't we make that possible? A code action request is sent from the client to the server to compute commands for a given text document and range. So they're tied to a document and a specific point or points in that document. The commands either typically are code fixes or refactor and beautify code. They're the result of a text document code action request. So we know we want to look at that. And you guessed it, there also are some capabilities we need to specify. So let's scroll down and figure out what the server capability is. We need to specify a code action provider. And we can just say that it's true if we don't want to get into code action options. So let's just do this. We'll do the simple version. So the first thing we'll do is wire this up to our server. And we'll just do that by putting in the method here. And that's going to be text document code action. And we'll call code action from there. Haven't implemented it yet, so let's do that. This file will live alongside completion because it's also a text document method. So we'll just call it code action.ts. Great. This is going to do export const code action equals a method which takes a message of type request message. And then it returns, what does this return? Let's look at our docs. So we'll scroll down. We see that we get some code action params, context. It returns a code action array or a command array or null. We're going to skip over commands for now, but we will get the code action. And we also need to get the code action params. So we'll just go ahead and grab this. We'll paste it in here. And so now we can say this is a code action or array or null. Perfect. Uh, so let's clean this up a little bit. We do want the title. We want the kind. We don't want diagnostics because we're not going to say what it resolves. We're going to trigger an edit and the edit will trigger our diagnostics refreshing. We don't care if it's preferred. We don't want to worry about being disabled. We do want the edit. So we'll take that. We don't want command. We do want data. 
We'll say data is of type unknown for now. Okay. Now we'll hop back over to our docs and we're going to get the code action params. All right, code action params. We don't care about the stuff they extend. We do care about the other things here though. So we'll paste this in here, get rid of this, get rid of this, this, and this. Okay, so this we can import. We can also import range. We don't have a code action kind or code action context. So let's work our way through those. Code action context is some diagnostics, which it tells you what overlap at that location. So that's really great. So we already have our diagnostics that say what the problem is. So now we can get those passed along to our code actions, which is awesome. We don't need these other two things. So let's just grab this. Get rid of the comments here. Perfect. Uh, I don't know if we can import this. We can't. So that is a type that's currently just being used by diagnostics. So let's go over there and we're going to export this. You could argue that we should move it to our types, but I'm not interested in type golfing right now. So we'll just import it. Uh, the code action kind is something we need to look at now. So over in our docs, we'll scroll back down to where that is. Code action kind. Code action kind is a string, which can be one of these things. We're going to make them all quick fixes. So we're just gonna hard code this actually. Perfect. And then edit is a workspace edit. Workspace edit represents changes to resources managed in a workspace. We definitely wanna get the changes. Those are the changes we want to make. Depending on client capability, you could do this. Hmm. Okay, so this is for creating an array of edits, create files, rename files, or delete files, uh, change annotations. I think we just want this first part. We'll try to roll with that. We'll grab that and paste it in over here. So what can we import here? We can import document URI. Actually, no, we can't because it's over in document, but it's not exported. So we'll just export that. Great. So now we can import it. And then text edit is something we don't know about yet. We haven't implemented that. Let's get rid of this comment and then figure out what text edit is. Text edit is very simple. So it's an interface which has a range that represents the text that you want to be manipulated. And then it has new text, which is used for the replacement. Awesome. Paste that in here, clean up. We already have range imported, so we're good to go. And so the first thing that we should do is what we've been doing of just implementing a hard coded thing, and then we'll work through making it more dynamic. So we're going to return an array of code actions. A code action has a title, so it's going to be replace me with hello. Then there's going to be a kind, which we're gonna say is always quick fix. Then there's going to be an edit, which is a workspace edit. Workspace edit has a changes node. We're actually going to make that not be optional here. We always wanna have that. In there is going to be the document URI, which we're gonna to have to get from params. So we'll say this is params.txt document. Actually, let's just go ahead and extract this first. So we'll say const params is going to be message.params as code action params. So we know that if, if we got here, these are going to conform to that. So then our changes can be params.textdocument.uri and that's going to be a text edit. So a text edit, oh, text edit array, sorry. So we'll make this an array. And then we know that text edit is a range and then the new text. So we can use the range from our params. And then the new text will be hello. All right, that's happy. Is there anything else we wanna add in there? We could add in some data. 
but we're not going to do that yet. Uh, let's see what happens here. So we'll reload. Oh, wait, we've got some errors. So let's show our errors. Cannot find code action. Right, we need to import that now that it's being exported. So we'll import it. And there's one more problem, which is that we need to add it to our valid return types. Excellent. Uh, so now we can retry. And if we get to a thing, we see that now we have this light bulb. And that light bulb is actually going to show up anywhere we go because we're not uh, being smart about it. We're not only doing it on diagnostics. But if we pick this and we do the light bulb, we can see replace me with hello. We can also see it if we do uh, command period, replace me with hello. I can just hit enter to accept that. Note that it doesn't replace the word you're hovering on, but it replaces the range that's selected. In this case, it was a single cursor position. If instead we select some stuff and we do it, now we see that it did actually clobber over the part that was selected. Excellent. So now we're ready to wire this up to be smarter so that it can work off of our diagnostics. So let's just close a few things here real quick. Make this a little more usable. All right, so we know that we're getting diagnostics and those diagnostics are diagnostics that are associated with the range that our code action is at. So we can get our diagnostics directly from our params. Params.context.diagnostics. Great. Instead of returning this hard-coded array, what we're going to return is our diagnostics transformed into code actions. This map will take a diagnostic and it's going to return a code action. So let's go ahead and type that as well. Actually, we could have multiple code actions per diagnostic because we want to give a code action for each of the suggested spellings to fix our invalid words. So let's make it a code action array. And that means that we need to change this to be a flat map. Great. Now we actually need to return this. So we'll say const code action. It's going to be, and we'll get a title. Hmm, what's the title going to be? The title should be change to or replace with something to that effect. So over here, if we were on H-E-Triple-L-O, our code action might be replace with hello, H-E-L-L-O, and then or replace with hell, and then we'll have one for each of those. So the question I guess is how do we get the data out of our diagnostic? We could try to parse the message, but the fact that I use the word data should be a clue for us to go over to diagnostic and realize that we have this data unknown. This is actually an LSP any in the spec, so it could be literally anything. And we're going to call it a spelling suggestion data. And so we could add in more things as we make more diagnostics later, but we'll go ahead and type this like that. Interface for spelling suggestion data is going to be invalid word, which is a string and then word suggestions, which is a string array. We could also add a type on here for later case handling and that sort of thing. So we'll do that uh, as well. Cool, and then we need to make our return value conform to this. So data is going to be invalid word, word suggestions, and then our type of spelling suggestion. Great. So now over here, we know that from our diagnostic, we can get data dot invalid word. Actually, we're going to do, oh, we want the word suggestion. So we need to go ahead and start looping up here. So this will be diagnostic dot data dot word suggestions dot for dot map. We're going to take a word suggestion and return a code action. Okay, uh, so our title is going to be replaced with word suggestion. We also need to let's return this and then let's return this. Okay, 
So what else do we need in our code action? We're going to need a kind, which is going to be quick fix. Let's get rid of these. We're not going to work with the data right now, but we do want those to be required. And then our edit is going to be changes node, which has a text document URI and then an array of text edits. So changes, we're going to have params.textdocument.uri, which is going to be an array of text edits. Those have a range, and we're going to use the diagnostic range here so that our replacement covers the entire span of the diagnostic, even if our code action range is just a single point. And then the new text will be word suggestion. So we're not actually using our invalid word from the data. We could remove that and things should just work fine. Let's do that real quick, just for cleanliness. And then we'll take it out down here. Great, let's kick this and see what happens. All right, so we'll make a minor change. And now we have hello with a light bulb. We can replace with hello. We can replace with all of these. Let's just replace it with Jello uh, to see if it works, and it does. So as we type new things, we can hit Command Period and replace them with something that is an actually valid spelling. You may know the shortcut for jumping to the next diagnostic, but if you don't, you can always find the shortcut in the palette. So you can keep going through and hitting that and get to all of your spelling corrections. Hit Command Period accept the new fix, and you're good to go. We did it. We learned about diagnostics and code actions. We built our own version of spell check. Sure, we didn't exactly build the algorithm ourselves, but we could have using the Levenstein distance. Instead, we learned how to shell out to other programs to do heavy lifting when we don't want to do it all ourselves. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope you'll join me for the next one. Thanks, and see you soon.